Welcome to another moment in the Word. Why is it that some people can see the workings of God and respond very differently? And perhaps you, you have heard the Word of God and you have responded and it's caused repentance. It's caused you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You love Him more and yet others would hear the same message and they find great disapproval. They make jest of it. Why is that? Well, that's what we're looking at in the passage now. We're in Acts, we're in chapter 2, we're looking only at two verses, 12 and 13. And it says, And they were all amazed, and they were perplexed, saying one to another, What means this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. Well, as we look at the responses to those who were these Galileans who were speaking in a language they had not learned, and they were speaking perfect in that language, in that dialect, as if they had grown up in that area. Sixteen different languages. It's an amazement. The actual list is in the verses just preceding this. We find in the beginning in verses 6 and 7 that when this began, those that were hearing of the multitude that had come together, they were confounded. And, and that means that they didn't have a category to understand what was going on. They were literally confounded. There was no explanation. And then there were others that they heard every man in their own language. That's what caused them to be confounded. But they go on beyond that. And it reads in verse 7, they were all amazed. And that is an internal reaction. They were amazed, and as you listen to the Word of God, that causes you to be amazed. And that is, is that, which direction do I go, having heard this now? And then we find they marveled. Now that's external, that they're expressing then their wonder, their marvel, that even could possibly lead to their worship. And so they're saying to one another, Behold, are these not Galileans? They had not gone to seminary. They had not gone to university. They had not been trained in some yeshiva. No, they were not even from Galil from uh, J uh, Judah, from uh, Jerusalem. They instead were Galileans. They're ordinary people. And Paul says, Take a look among yourself, brethren. There are not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty. God delights in using that which is nothing to bring to nothing that which thinks it is. In other words, God uses our weakness to show his strength. He uses us to show his glory, whether it's to the angels or it's to the unbeliever, or it's even to edify other saints. So now what we're looking at is this passage, and we see two groups of people, two groups of people that are responding, and notice the content in the prior verse, verse 11, that they were speaking, and not just in different languages, but they were speaking a common message, and the message was the wonderful works of God. Now, is that your message? As you're going through the day, are you telling others about the wonderful works of God? Now, the response was, verse 12 begins with day. Day in Greek means but. So there's a contrast. But they were all amazed. And the word amazed means, and it's in the imperfect, it's an ongoing, it's an action, and, and they are beside themselves. Again, there's this idea that this is causing bewilderment and understanding. They just don't have, but it goes beyond that. They were also perplexed, and that word perplexed means they don't have a category. There is no language, there is no idea that they have to explain. Explain what? Notice what they are perplexed about by what they're saying. They're saying to one another, what means this? Now, I want you to notice that little phrase, to one another. It is alos pros alos. 
Alos means other, so other speaking to other. Isn't that what we often do when we don't understand something? We go to another. And, and sometimes that helps. At least it helps because we know we're not alone in our perplexity. But what doesn't help is that if we're just talking to ourselves, we may not find the answer. We've got to talk to God. They're not praying and saying, explain this. Oh, no, they're just talking to one another. And now we look and say, what are they saying? Well, they're saying to one another, and again, it's in the imperfect. It's an ongoing. They're continuing to talk to one another and ask, what does this mean? Now, the word for mean there is thelos. It means purpose. What is the whole intent of this? And the this is referring back to the languages that these Galileans, these average people, these farmers and fishermen, that they're speaking in languages that they never learned. And, and it's quite amazing. What they're focusing on is the sign rather than the statement. They're focusing on the medium rather than the message. They're focusing on the wonder rather than on God who is giving them the ability to do it. Too often times that's what we focus on. We focus on the phenomenon rather than focusing on the substance of what really God is communicating, aren't we? And so consequently, that's what's going on here. But they don't have any answers, so they continue in this bewilderment. It's a good thing that Peter will later on respond to this by standing up and delivering the first sermon of the newly formed church. He will now explain that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Messiah, who had died on the cross for their sins, has been raised again, and that glorifies the Father, but it redeems us, and 3,000 of them will be saved. However, there's a second group, and that is found in verse 13. And that word, others, that you see in the Greek, it's not the same word in the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the English, rather, as others. You don't see the same word in the Greek. Instead of alos, it's hetros. And hetros means another of a different kind. In other words, they have a different spirit. They have a different attitude, a different way of thinking. And they are mocking. And that word is a real interesting word because it means to use jest or joking to put and down another, to dismiss. And in other words, to, to use sarcasm or mockery to just simply cavalierly reject what they're saying. And what do they say? Notice what their focus is. These men, well, obviously they're going back to the Galileans again. They're looking down on these men, and now they try to explain. They're trying to explain the supernatural by using natural explanations. Isn't that what often happens? If we reject God, and if we don't believe that God created the heavens and the earth, then we've got to come up with a Big Bang theory or something to explain how the universe came about and how it's had such precision and, and how it, it began and, and where it's going and why we would have meaning in life and, and why you're so unique. But if we don't believe that God did it, then we'll have to believe in some, and it'll take oftentimes more faith to believe in the explanations that others would give than to believe God himself. But that's what they have. And you'll see here, that's precisely what happens. Their argument, these men, they come back with saying that they're drunk with new wine. They're full of it. <laughs> no, no, wait, hold it. If you're drunk, does that make you more lucid? Does that make you more cognitively functional? Does that make you make sense? Does being drunk enable you to speak a foreign language? That doesn't make sense. In other words, their explanation takes more belief than to just simply believe the words that these men were giving. And number two, they say they were drunk with new wine. 
And now the word for wine there is not oinos, which is the typical Greek word for wine, which is the intoxicating form of wine. It is glucose, and the word glucose means sweet wine. It's the kind we would call grape juice. It, it is that which is the new wine. Well, we're four months after the period in which that wine would have been made. In other words, it is not even the time. There was no new wine that was available. And number three is you can't get drunk on grape juice. So these three arguments actually are arguments that really don't make sense themselves. Oh, but you see, here's the problem, the real problem. If I reject God, then I'm not going to make sense. In fact, it's so interesting. In Psalm 14, and this is one of the few Psalms in the Bible that is repeated almost word for word. It's not only found in Psalm 14, it's found in Psalm 53, almost identical, word for word. And you will find the first verse says, the fool, the Nabal, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And what is Nabal? Oh, you Remember, he's actually a character in the Old Testament. He refused to listen to the, the words of his wife, to the reasoning of her, his wife. He was refusing to listen to the reasoning of God to care for David. And that's what the fool does. The fool objects to the truth. And because they reject to the truth, and they'll say, therefore, there is no God. And because they'll say there is no God, they categorically remove the supernatural. They categorically remove the spiritual. And you're left only with the physical. And if you're left only with the physical, then your life has no meaning once you die. If you have only the physical, your life has no meaning if you've lost your health. Your life has no meaning if you lose things. Because that's what that person puts their whole life and existence in what we feel, see, touch, smell, hear, and taste. Oh, my dear one, you know and I know that's not the case. The fool has said there is no heart, and therefore, as a result, they don't do good. Yeah, because it's not just a belief. The belief becomes behavior. Foolish thinking, foolish believing becomes foolish living. And then we look and we see that that's also what is said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says in verse 14, the natural man. The natural man is simply the sukkas. The person who has only a soul, there's no spirit. And that's the problem. If I don't acknowledge the Spirit of God, and I don't acknowledge what God is doing in the lives of others, and you know when you're living, when you're talking, when you're acting in the Spirit, it changes everything. Your prayers are different. Your teaching is different. Your behavior, your ministries are different. It's all guided by and directed by the Holy Spirit. But the natural man discounts the Spirit. And so consequently, they receive not the things of the Spirit of God. Why don't they receive the things of the Spirit of God? Well, Paul tells you. He says, first of all, they're foolishness unto them. Well, we go right back to that word Nabal again, don't we? And we go right to this, where it's now foolishness by saying they're drunk with new wine. That's why they're speaking languages that they never learned, but they make sense. And they are communicating now the things of God and the wonders of God. Oh, but we want to say that's all foolishness to us because we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. We don't believe that God is spirit. We don't believe in God. We don't believe in the supernatural. We don't believe in the spiritual. And so their foolishness unto them, neither can they know them because they're spiritually discerned. You see, the real eternal things in life are spiritual. Paul says, we don't walk by the flesh. We walk by the spirit. The things which are seen, they're only temporal. That means that they're limited. But the things which are spiritual, they're eternal. So now, where are you? And how do you respond? How do you respond to the Word of God and the works of God? Whether it's in your life or whether it's in the lives of others, maybe in your assembly, maybe in the things that you see around you, 
But as you see them, how do you explain them? Do you explain them only in natural terms? Or do you explain them in God terms? Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word that changes us and for your Holy Spirit that enables us to understand your word and for your Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to actually be living epistles and to live out your word. Thank you, Father, for your Son, whose blood was shed for us, that we might live, that our sins would be forgiven, and that we might glorify you. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.